Hello and welcome to the India Story, the program that tells you all the big events taking place in India and analyzes them for a global audience. I'm Vikram Chandra. This week on the show, the parliament has passed a key legislation which seeks to refine and redefine the regulatory landscape of the country with decriminalization of minor offenses under 42 acts to reduce compliance burden and to promote the ease of doing business in the country. Now, this is important. Why is it important? Because here in the India story and every time anywhere in the world people talk about the India story, the big thing that people keep complaining about is ease of doing business, red tape, what do we do about it? So if steps are being taken to cut that red tape, it is a step in the right direction. We're going to be discussing this in much greater detail on this program with a special interview with Gautam Chikarmane, the person who wrote the book, Jail for Doing Business, which listed many of the compliances that need to be done away with. The Jan Vishwas bill removes some of them and therefore it is a step in the right direction. What else needs to be done? We're going to be telling you on this program. We also have a special interview with the Emphasis CEO, Nitin Rakesh, coming up a short while from now. What is going to be the future of the Indian IT industry, which is pretty much been one of the key foundational bedrocks of the India story for the last 15, 20 years. What's its future and how is AI going to be impacting the Indian IT uh, sector in the future? Also a chat with the new woman cricketer on the block, much talked about, Minu Mani uh, is going to be joining us, the first woman cricketer from Kerala and one of the very few cricketers from Kerala to join the Indian cricket team. All of that coming up for you. But first, a quick look at what made headlines in India this week. There have been concerns after some violence between two communities in Delhi's satellite city, Gurugram, which has raised concerns about the security situation and what many are calling the lack of administration. The violence erupted before a religious march by one community and the Haryana administration's handling of the situation came under scrutiny. That was followed by prolonged incidents of violence that continued for two or three days in a place which has often been considered one of the hubs for the India story, a place, Gurugram, where 70% of the revenue for Haryana actually comes and a place where many international companies have their headquarters. All of this uh, essentially involved a wanted individual, of course, Monu Manesar, and there were videos circulating about him and whether he was going to be associated with the religious march. That was followed uh, by violence and questions about a lack of action over the entire situation. All we can hope for is that the situation will return to complete normalcy as soon as possible. The Gujarat Chief Minister Bhupendra Patel has indicated a consideration for requiring parental consent for love marriages. This responds to a demand from certain sections of uh, the, the community there in Gujarat, but the comments have sparked a debate on the constitutional feasibility of such a requirement because some are arguing that the right to choose a spouse is a constitutional right. So there is obviously going to be considerable debate on this entire situation there in Gujarat. Moving on, the GST Council has decided to go ahead with the implementation of the 28% tax on online gaming, casinos and horse racing from October the 1st. You'll remember there had been a considerable ruckus over this which had also been featured right here on the India Story. However, the tax panel has agreed to review six months after implementation. In its previous meeting on July the 1st, the GST Council had decided to levy a uniform 28% tax on the full value, on the full face value of online gaming casinos and horse racing. The industry was up in arms saying that this move would be a death knell, um, especially for the online gaming industry. And a lot of global attention this week, which has had its impact in India as well, on the fact that the global credit rating agency, Fitch, downgraded US sovereign ratings from AAA to AA+. Fitch has cited various reasons for this downgrade, including an already high and growing government debt burden and a steady deterioration in governance over the last 20 years. Fitch expects further fiscal deterioration over the next three years. This, of course, led to a lot of volatility in global markets. And the Indian markets also saw deep cuts as a result of the volatility. Meanwhile, the White House and the US Treasury have come out to disagree with the downgrade and have criticized the action. 
Let's move on now to our top story. You've often heard me saying right here on the India story that one of the most important aspects of driving the India story and taking it forward is the ease of doing business, ending harassment, making sure that people who are compliant with the law have a good, easy, welcoming, benign atmosphere to actually do business in. And this is something which has been stated at multiple levels by everybody, whether it's industry or the government or experts. They all say that this is something that needs to be done. Well, there's some good news in our major development. The Jan Vishwas Amendment to Provisions Bill 2023 has now been successfully passed by Parliament. The primary objective of this bill is to bolster the ease of doing business by decriminalizing minor offenses. This means elimination of jail sentences or conversion of, you know, of them into fines and penalties to basically strengthen the business environment by streamlining operations, by saving valuable time and resources for both the government and for businesses. If it's a minor offense, if it's not something that requires years of, prof, of prosecution, simplify the entire system. That's the principle behind this. This principle obviously needs to be extended even further. And that's what everyone's hope is, but it's a great start. And joining us now to talk about it is going to be Gautam Chikarmane, the man who wrote the book, Jailed for Doing Business, and a lot of the provisions that were actually amended in the Janre Chwas Bill were also mentioned uh, in, in your book. So, Gautam, we're going to ask you, you must be happy to see this being done. You may also be feeling there's, a lot, there's lots more to be done, and I'm going to be asking you what else needs, still needs to be done. But before I get your reactions to this, let's just quickly play for you some of the major findings, some of the major amendments that were made in this bill. The ease of doing business is something that the Modi government has been determined to improve. In a major development that furthers this aim, the Jan Vishwas bill has been passed. The main objective of the bill is to do away with outdated rules of criminal punishment and reduce compliance burden. This bill decriminalizes minor offenses through amendments in 183 provisions of 42 acts. It converts fines to penalties with the objective of avoiding court prosecution and it removes imprisonment for several offenses. पहली बार गलती करते हैं उसको एक मौका दिया जाए सुधरने का एक मौका दिया जाए कि वो आगे गलती ना करे दंड हो पेनल्टी के रूप में फाइन के रूप में दंड हो पर एक सरल व्यवस्था Small mistakes, technical and procedural errors that can lead to imprisonment not only causes fear but also proves to be a burden on the courts. With this bill, the aim is to lessen the burden on the legal system and simultaneously boost investor confidence and improve the ease of doing business in India. The bill seeks to establish a balance between the severity of the violation and the gravity of the punishment prescribed. Experts say these changes will enhance India's credibility as a global investment and manufacturing destination. Bureau Report, we on World is One. And joining us now for a lot more on that, Gautam Chikarmane, senior journalist, the man who actually wrote Jailed for Doing Business, a book which, how many provisions did you find? Uh, compliances and other such things which could be done away with. Uh, but 113 are gone, 131 are gone now. Uh, so first thing is, it has been written by Rishi Agrawal and me. So I, I'm, the, I'm the co-author. There, there are two. Uh, We're going to get Rishi in here one of these days to talk about you this. Must, you must get Rishi. Uh, he is the data man. Yeah. Uh, now, in this particular bill, there are 183 provisions that have been decriminalized, of which 113 pertain to doing business. The others are uh, not for, they are outside the ambit of doing business or let us say the corporate parts. Uh, of these 113, uh, if you put it in perspective, firstly, I'm delighted that the bill has been passed by Parliament. Uh, I'm delighted that after we wrote the report, the manner in which the government took cognizance of our findings, in one week we had met uh, 
three ministries, one cabinet secretary, and the ball was rolling at Niti Aayog. We, they formed a committee where uh, each of these ministries was called. Uh, the fine tuning of each of those, the the compliances that came under those particular ministries were uh, listed, and and there was a big debate about which should go, which should stay. There was a debate about how to decide which should go and which should stay. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted that in one year, uh, we, we, we published well, our report and that's in February. Important because a lot of people say the government moves really slowly, no, but no, here no, in one year, bang, the bill is, the is fastest, passed, it's this low. This is the fastest that I have experienced. In February 2022, uh, uh, the, our, our report came out. By February 2023, the bill was in parliament. It, 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 it came in, in, in the last date uh, on the last day of the winter session, which is sometime in December. And presumably this is being pushed to the highest levels. And now we have the bill. So I think it's exceptional. The process by which the bill has passed, which is, uh, ha has been enacted, is, is fascinating in the sense that it's a usual process. Uh, 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 the, the, the cabinet prepares the bill, it uh, tables it in parliament, it goes to a select committee. Uh, it generally goes to a uh, parliamentary committee. This time it went to a select committee. The select committee gave its recommendations. Some changes were made. It was retabled. Uh, Lok Sabha passed it. Rajya Sabha has now passed it. It awaits the presidential uh, seal and before it becomes law through a gazetted. Uh, so I think this Can is. Can I just ask one, one leading question? In the middle of this entire process, the fact that it was done so fast and in your various meetings, was there this recognition that you were hearing from the government? at the highest levels, ease of doing business is crucially important. Reducing compliance is crucially important. Ending harassment, which India has been notorious for forever, is crucially important. Is that the central message that lies behind this? So this, I cannot answer in a yes, no. The government right at the top wants the change. At the political level, the government wants change. At the political level, they pushed with all their might to get this done. At the, uh, at the level of the organization of the meeting uh, at Niti, we found uh, uh, Amitabh Kant ji, he, he was the uh, CEO then, was, uh, he was fantastic, uh, you know, organizing everything, getting the secretaries in, on the table, putting, uh, putting the force behind w w what he had uh, been uh, asked to do. Down the line, we faced resistance in the sense that who has been jailed so far? Please tell us. This was a common refrain from almost every ministry. Tell us who has been jailed so far. And my answer to all of them has been the same. Perhaps nobody, and that requires a different research. If you want, we will do that research. But my gut is that perhaps nobody has been jailed for any provision uh, that we have listed, which is 26,134. But what does that tell it you about you? The, it, it could also be because what people does are paying that, money and not getting What does that tell you about you? First, you are not doing your job. Because if there is a law of the land, it is your job to ensure that, because you have been tasked with it, it is your job to ensure that the law is followed. If the law is not being followed, and if there is nobody in jail, it probably means rent seeking is happening at a mass level, uh, which is what through anecdotal evidence we keep hearing. And so obviously rent seeking, polite word for corruption and bribery means Absolutely. that do away with the provisions and nobody can make money to start with, right? That's a logical process. That's it. So now we uh, never, uh, there is a small uh, uh, layering here as well. The 26,134 provisions are there at an aggregate for all businesses for in, in India, okay? Nowhere have we argued that each of these provisions needs to go. We are only seeking a rationalization. If you don't reconstitute the canteen committee every two years, despite the fact that your canteen contractor is giving you great service, is that a jail term? I don't think so. But willful tax evasion, should that be a jail term? Absolutely. Willful destruction of the environment, should that be a jail term? Absolutely. Now, how much should that jail term be, etc.? What should the fine be? We, are, we, are, we sought a rationalization, not an ending of all, compli of all okay. imprisonment. I, I'm going to come to some of the broader issues around this in just a second or two. But first of all, from the point of view of what the Janvishwas bill has done, you said 113 specifically from ease doing business, and there's 26,000. So if you're looking at that, you're saying, okay, there's still a long way to go, it's so far I, less than I, half a percent. I say, but so how many of them do you still think need to be done? So how far on that process are we? So firstly, I think uh, this is a great start, as I was saying, but it is it not... It also sets the framework for it, it subsequent... It sets the framework. There could be a second absolutely, bill, third absolutely, bill. Absolutely, absolutely. This is going to happen. But it is not even the tip of the iceberg. It is a snowflake. It's a tiny snowflake sitting on top of the tip of the iceberg 
called uh, excessive compliances. Now, how many of them should be retained? How many of them should not be retained? According to our estimate, uh, uh, about half of them can, can go very easily. Okay. But uh, that needs debate. That needs ministerial uh, uh, and bureaucratic engagements to understand the ground realities. We have done our work as scholars. So as Puritans, we will say this needs to be done. But the on-ground con on ground conversations could be different to which we are open. Okay. Let me come to a broader issue, right? Let's not try and put this in the greater context of the India story and taking India forward and how, what does it mean to make India one of the most developed and prosperous countries going forward. And ease of doing business is very clear. You said everyone agrees, including the government, that it needs to be done. If there is one major problem that you often heard complained about in, in India when it comes to doing businesses, you know, UK, let me try and put this into some sort of a framework. You're the good people and they are bad people. They're guys who are complying with the law and wanting to be honest and do all the right things, and they are bad guys who are crooks and whatever, right? The objective should be that a good person should be treated with kid gloves and should never face any problems and never be harassed and if somebody is harassing that person should be beaten and said go away you know don't don't harass the person and the bad person should be punished in India that quite often does not happen even if you're a good person you can face harassment you can be caught up in courts for years altogether and if you're a bad person and there's delays happening and you are maybe facing punishment six seven years later sometimes you'll just have bribed your way and got out of it so that you want to incentivize people to do to be good and disincentivize them from being bad. It's human psychology. That sometimes doesn't happen here. And the delays in our processes add to that. Would you agree with that overall construct that I painted? Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. The incentive to do good is not very much. The incentive to do bad and uh, run away with it is, is higher. So what I see this is that uh, when the 1991 reforms happened and the quota permit Raj was removed, was ended, the tyranny of that quota permit Raj ended, what the governments and the subsequent governments after that forgot was finally there is an inspector Raj. That inspector Raj thrives on these compliances. With the, with the reforms in compliances, we will see the end of inspector Raj. Who is behind the inspector Raj are the policy makers, various ministries. Now let me tell you how much energy of our economic ministries is going uh, in, in, into retaining the tyranny of compliances. Every year, approximately 4,000 to 6,000 new compliances are added, or they, they change. Uh, they, they could be filings, they could be disclosures, they could be actual physical uh, inspections. Last year, 6,815 changes happened in compliances. Last week, last month, 636. Last week, 222, which means approximately 22 changes in compliances are happening every day. This is where the mind of our economic ministries, the officials there, the policy makers is going. This is the energy that is being dissipated to ensure that the, the inspector, the clasp of the inspector... But those changes remains. could be positive changes. Maybe they're making it easier in some cases. I doubt it. Uh, I doubt it. You're being cynical. <laughs> okay. I doubt it because I, I, I've seen some of these. You're in a, fact, this morning... You're a journalist. It's your job to be cynical, which yesterday, is good, but... Hold, yesterday, there were 20 new compliances that happened. Just yesterday, I'm giving you yesterday's data. Okay. It's so just uh, of, that is the that rate red tape. It, that red, okay, but from the principle of it, when you see the big changes that are happening, uh, I mean, let's, let's try and find some big bang ideas, low hanging fruit. Somebody watching this saying, "All right, let's do something dramatic and decisive to try and change the the atmosphere and signal that red tape will be cut and you know boost animal spirits." When it comes to taxation. People will argue that in the last three or four years, a fair amount has happened to make it faceless, to reduce rank seeking, to make sure that, you know, if you're paying your taxes, you'll get your returns really fast and the process will be streamlined. And the interesting thing, Gautam, is that the results then start to show. You're seeing the number of people who are filing tax returns, you're seeing the amount of tax coming in. If you simplify things, you make it easier to have compliance, quite often the rewards are instant. Is that so, a good yeah, lesson so, so to what I, we should I do? Agree. I'm going to come to some of the things that need to be done, but is that an example I, of what we should follow? I agree with the processes of the tax compliances being eased. I disagree with the manner in which status quo is being 
continued in the sense that you may have six crore filers, but of which only 1.5 or two crores are actually paying the taxes. So I think that tax, the ease of paying taxes is a good thing. But if every budget you are going to keep raising the people who have to pay taxes and continue to put the burden on that small constituency of uh, people, it's, it, it's not going to work. Okay. At some point, you need to reverse this. You need to end this every budget. Uh, how much tax has been reduced, etc. I don't think this is a, a, a right thing. One, one point here. The manner in which the PAN came for income tax is what is required for an entrepreneur. Let there be an entrepreneurial number. Because the, each entrepreneur has to give, same kind, give the same information in different manner to different ministries. The Food FSSAI Act wants something else. The Environment Protection Act wants something else. The labor provisions, several of them, need something else. The state laws seek something else. If there is one enterprise, one number, like a PAN number, where, like Aadhaar, for instance, if it can be digitally placed there with a flick of a button, all the regulators can get access to all the information that they need from RBI, SEBI, to food inspector, etc. I think that is where. So income tax, you mentioned, is is a good thing, it's a good model, it needs to be transposed so, on entrepreneurial number. So, okay, let's look at some of the big pending reforms or the quick reforms that could come. As I said, we're all in agreement that the basic principle should be reward the good and punish the bad. I'll be clear on that. Therefore, the question should again be, you have to, one of the major areas, obviously, that we keep talking about on the show is judicial reforms. You've got to shorten the period because long, lengthy legal proceedings in a sense, a, a person who's guilty wouldn't mind a process taking seven years. A person who's innocent wants it done over with and finished so that he or she can exonerate himself or herself. So you need to compress that. Would you say that that's one of the major items that has to be done? Uh, it is. It is. But do you really think it's a, that the judiciary is an institution that is open to reform, leave around criticism? Uh, do you think we can we can criticize the judiciary sitting out here and still remain sitting here without it's being uh, hauled up for contempt? Okay. I think judiciary is a gone case. We have to just live with the nonsense that we have. Well, yes and, and no. I mean, look, look, hang on. It's not entirely sometimes in the hands of the judiciary. They are I'm not talking about judges. I'm talking about the entire judiciary in the sense so if, if lawyers make their money through prolonging of uh, trial, uh, where do you think this is going to end? So if you're talking about judicial reforms, it's actually uh, advocate reforms where uh, the incentives of the advocates need to change before they are taken to the high court. Okay. Secondly, but, secondly but, you, you have these SATs, uh, you, you have these tribunals, tribunals. tribunals, right? Let us look at uh, securities tribunal. The matter, uh, somebody loses a matter uh, at SEBI, he goes to uh, SAT, SAT undoes what SEBI has done, they go to Supreme Court. Even, even the, the, the very essence of having a tribunal has been has, has been wasted. Now you can say you should say the tribunal. And all of that is, happens is after two point. years of delay. Yeah, and look at the look at the illiteracy. RBI came out with a fantastic proposal to protect investors. Sat uh, unturned it. Uh, sorry, the, the the tribunal unturned it, and, and Supreme Court Supreme Court agreed with it. This uh, I'm talking about this uh, cryptocurrencies where, where RBI RBI did the right thing. So, but, uh, but uh, as a regulator, it, it did the right thing. It um, by, by the consumers. But okay, the, the let judicial me process is ended. So there is you need literacy there as well. You're going to need us to discuss each of these things individually and what the merits and the, and the demerits were. So I'm looking at the broader picture. There are still ways in which you can unburden the judiciary. The government is a major litigant, right? If the government was to just reduce the amount of areas which it itself is litigating, that takes 50% of the burden out. That can be done at the press of a button. Something else that can be done at a press of a button, something which industry has been clamoring for, have a statute of limitations or a law of limitations. If you have not been, if something has been done and you've not been able to establish it or prove it within five years or seven years or 10 years, the matter should drop. Again, that reduces 20% of the burden. Two simple steps. 60, 70% of the pressure on the judiciary could just go away. Why don't we do it? Uh, it may not be such a straight line. I think uh, uh, there is enough creativity in, in the system to, uh, to ensure that they continue. However, the points that you make are right, uh, uh, and I think it needs a deeper discourse. I, I, I don't know much about it, so I don't want to comment too early. Okay, but those are the sort of things that you feel Absolutely. can Absolutely. These, these are low-hanging fruits that can happen. They may, they don't, you, may not, you may not even need a legislative change. It could just be an executive decision. Okay, if that happens, that'll be good. Okay, from your point of view, low-hanging fruit, what can be done next six months? 
to make it. I mean, look, it's a great step. I mean, let's not be critical. I'm glad that people have uh, a bill has come passed within one year to say let's ease compliance, let's make ease of doing business more important. It's a great step, but. I think the question is glass half full, glass half empty, a lot more still to be done, obviously, which, which there is. So, what would you do? My fear is the next six months, uh, there is not going to be any more economic reforms. The next think. six months after that will be elections. I think happen. Right. You have only six months now before I, I, elections. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I, I think elections have already begun, uh, and, and you can see it through the violence that's happening around us all the time. Uh, you can see it in the new nomenclatures of the opposition versus the uh, governing coalitions, etc. That's happening. I think the entire energy of our political class is going to be on elections, and perhaps rightly so. This is a cost that democracies have to bear. Whoever comes in the next government, if if the if the uh, incumbent government continues, I'm supremely optimistic about the changes. If it's a new government, we'll need to see what they do. All right, so in any case, you're working on the next set of recommendations. Absolutely. Whoever, we do our in, dharma. Whoever is it's in power, the political whoever class is in power it. it makes sense to have ease of building business and ease yeah. of compliance. See, our that's the our way the India story will move forward, which I guess is the Our job move. is to put all the ideas out there in public domain for the political class to pick up and run with whichever uh, uh, suits them or whichever they, 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 they think would do good to the country. All right, Gautam Chakramane been pushing uh, a lot of the things that are that are there in the Janvish Rash bill. So congratulations. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining Thanks. us. Right. All right, let's move on to what some of the big international newspapers are saying about India. Could the conflict in Manipur have become an issue that uh, the Prime Minister cannot ignore any further? The New York Times had an entire article on that, looking at Manipur and looking at what specifically needs to be done, talking about social cohesion and social unrest. That, that story was there in the New York Times. Nikkei Asia has a really interesting in-depth dive into Apple's plans in India. Inside Apple's India Dream is that article in Nikkei. It's talking about how Apple's expansion of production is not just a strategic endeavor. It says there are a lot of other companies will have to come into it. And while China has been the place where Apple has had, well, a lot of its bets in the past, now Apple is aiming to broaden and deepen its manufacturing operations in India. A detailed story in Nikkei Asia on that. And uh, a number of climatechangenews.com and many others looked at what had happened at the G20 Nations meeting, uh, which did discuss a lot on climate change. There wasn't any clear agreement, though, on emission reduction titles. So those are just three of the articles that were referring to India in the global press. The IT sector in India has been beaten down quite a bit in the recent months. This is also evident in the quarterly results of companies. A slowdown in key markets, including the US and Europe, has been one of the reasons for the stress. Analysts are of the opinion that in the short to medium term, the IT sector could continue to face headwinds. A recent report by JP Morden also paints a similar picture of the industry. The brokerage says that deferred project starts, project halts and cancellations are likely to persist. It's been a turbulent time for the Indian IT industry. In fact, shares of the entire IT pack have been beaten down this year. The recent quarterly earnings also reflect the macroeconomic uncertainty companies are facing. The banking crisis in the United States and Europe, high global inflation lending to a rising interest rate scenario have all led to a marked slowdown in key markets, including US and Europe. A combination of all these factors are taking a toll on IT companies. As a result, clients have been cutting costs, especially reducing discretionary spending. This has led to a reduced demand for its services, impacted deal conversions and even delays in projects. Analysts believe that the sector will continue to face these headwinds in the short to medium term. However, with the end of the interest rate tightening cycle somewhere on the horizon now, there are hopes that demand will start picking up. In fact, CEO of Emphasis says that green shoots of activity buildup are now visible, but that this phase of uncertainty for the sector could last another three to six months. Meanwhile, the artificial intelligence disruption is also something that the industry is still coming to terms with. With many companies pouring money into AI, the jury is still out on how the integration of AI within the IT space will play out. They've also said that increased competition for a smaller pie could trigger falling win rates, pressures on pricing and deteriorating deal terms. 
Well, joining me now to talk a lot more on all of that is the CEO of one of India's leading IT companies, Emphasis. Nitin Rakesh now joins us to talk about the outlook for Emphasis and for the IT sector. And of course, that overall question of how AI is going to impact all of this. Nitin, thank you so much. Always a pleasure speaking to you. Let me start off by asking for your views. How do you, how is Emphasis doing? And how, if you want to say something about how the broader IT industry is doing. Thanks for having me, Vikram. I think uh, we're going through a pretty interesting phase uh, in our sector, and of course, in general, in the in the environment with the with the business uh, macro as well. Firstly, I think uh, we probably lived through a fifty-year first with the kind of macro environment we've dealt with in the Western world in the last twelve months, and as uh, as we kind of emerge out of that, uh, the last six months have all been dominated by the by the next big thing in tech, which is, seems to be AI. Uh, so I think from our perspective, uh, you know, as we always say, technology, you know, brings up with the next big pivot and the next, uh, you know, wave of innovation kind of gets unleashed. I think we are at the beginning of, of another unleashing of a fairly large opportunity, both for us and our customers in how they can embrace this, this massive opportunity to, to, to bring in not only productivity, but uh, a whole new way of doing business, especially as they engage with their end customers. So I think it's a pretty interesting time. Uh, you know, we are right. really, uh, you know, at the cusp of uh, of some um, some real cool work that's going to get done. Now then, what's your view on IT spending in the US and Europe in the second half of this year? Uh, we're hearing reports that clients have been cutting costs, especially in dis uh, discretionary spending. What's the situation that you've been seeing on the ground on that? Yeah, I think as I mentioned, uh, the last 12 months have been a fairly headwinded macro environment, just given the fact that, uh, you know, we went through an unprecedented interest rate uh, tightening phase where we went from zero to 5%, uh, you know, in just 12 months in the US and the rest of the world has followed through as well. So there was definitely, uh, you know, a very large cyclical downturn in sectors that were so tightly associated with the, with the interest rate environment, you know, whether it was parts of consumer finance, mortgages, of course, we've seen the impact of that play out in 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 the real estate side as well. So uh, that definitely led to a fairly uh, uncertain environment. I think we joke that we are still wait, you know we are waiting for the recession we were promised, but without without that uh, clarity, I think it was very hard for for customers to make a decision on how to allocate spend, what kind of budgets to run with. So uh, that has been a fairly headwind environment, especially in sectors that I mentioned are are linked to the interest rate cycles. Having said that, I think as I mentioned in our uh, in our last quarter earnings call as well a couple of weeks ago, we've started to see at least some unlocking of decision making. Uh, we've definitely seen green shoots of uh, activity build up, uh, even on the on the sectors like mortgage, where I think things are starting to pick up a little bit, given the fact that the consensus now is that this that we are at the beginning of the end of the interest rate tightening cycle. So I think uh, early days green shoots visible, long way to go. Haven't really you know, uh, seen uh, complete certainty on which way the macro will head. But having said that, uh, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of activity pick up. Uh, I think we'll still have another three to six months of of this uncertain phase before we can we can clearly see which way the the macro is headed. So, are you in agreement with what many of the analysts have been saying about pain in the entire IT sector? And if so, how long do you believe this pain is likely to last for the industry? You know, uh, we've already been in that kind of an environment for the last, you know, I would say three to four quarters. Uh, as I mentioned, at least in our business, with the deal flow, the the, the closure of large TCV, uh, some uptick in activity on on the decision making side. Uh, at least there seems to be a base formation in play. I mean, if you think about the way the business is run, right? There is a origination phase where you originate opportunities. Then there is a decision phase, and then there is a conversion phase. We, origination was never a problem. I think there was a lot, lot of uh, activity in the pipeline for all our, in, you know, all, all of our companies in the industry. Then, of course, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, movement positively in the decision making of awarding those contracts. What we haven't yet fully seen is the conversion from TCV to revenue is still a little bit slower. But I think that that should improve and pick up as we get through the remainder of the year and early part of next year. So hard to call exactly, you know, where the uh, you know where where the, the things will turn because of uncertainty, and of course with the with the recent uh, you know situation around the U.S. rating, that obviously adds a little bit more to the uncertainty. But having said that, as I mentioned, 
uh, there are green shoots visible of at least activity picking up in certain parts of the segments of, of our business. Nitin, in a recent interview, you said that ChatGPT has shown people what AI can do, but that your company doesn't need to compete with ChatGPT or GPT-4, but instead use it for efficiency. An interesting and an important point. Can you elaborate on that? And how do you envisage the use of AI for the industry, for the industry as a whole, and for your company in particular? I think if you think about uh, what GPT-4 or ChatGPT is, it's really an instantation or an open source platform made available to the wide wide world, uh, which basically is now applicable. You know, from our perspective, every customer has an opportunity to use some element of, of AI. And you know, GPT-4 is one large instantation of, of a large language model, but that's not the only way to use AI. Uh, I think what we've seen, what to me, what the biggest impact that GPT-4 or ChatGPT has had is it has actually made this conversation mainstream, mainstream with the client community and with the boardrooms. Uh, we've been on this cloud and cognitive pivot for the last seven years at Emphasis. We've built out a whole tribes and squad model based on the front-to-back transformation driven by cloud and cognitive. So for us, it's been it's been coming for a while. We've had algorithms available on, on hyperscaler you know, marketplaces for better part of five years. But what this has really done is given us the opportunity to truly make that conversation mainstream. And the first set of applications and use cases, no surprise, coming out of how do I transform the way I engage with my end consumers, right? So customer experience transformation is, is probably the biggest use case right now that we are, we are seeing play out, uh, whether it is through conversational AI or some element of, of design embedded in it. Second, we can then start thinking about how do I truly you know, change the way we uh, we think of customer engagement and embed you know AI in almost every element of our engagement, whether it is customer service contact center, whether it is the app, whether it is uh, you know even a physical you know branch where the customer is going to walk in. It's a fairly high you know uh, opportunity area for that. And third, if you think about how do I change the productivity element that sits in my technology shop, right? We've talked a lot about developer productivity. So I think those are some early use cases. We see GPT-4 as a tool that can be embedded in multiple, you know, uh, applications. But there are other other very large, powerful platforms that are being being thought of. Obviously, there are large language models that will come out of almost right. large hyperscaler as well. So I think to me, when I say that we don't compete with GPT-4 because it's a tool that's available for us to apply to our custom businesses, rather than and we are obviously the more tools there are, the better opportunity there is for us to continue to to leverage them. In creating these applications, so you know we are we are the application side of the house. We will make applications come live through AI. We will embed AI in almost every business process, in every interaction, customer interaction, in in every part of their the value chain for their business. It's still early, of course, in the entire AI cycle. But do you eventually see the benefits of AI going to the client side, or coming to the IT industry and specifically to the IT industry in India, which used to do a lot of the work that. What, you know, maybe people will say that now AI can do some of that work, but on the other hand, the Indian IT industry may be also positioned to say we can hem help implement AI for you wherever in the world you are. So, so Vikram, I think it's a bit of both, uh, and this is not the first time that we are seeing a pivot that will impact or change some element of what we deliver and what we bring to customers. Um, you know, over the last twenty years, we've had this these waves come every four or five years. I think at this point in time. The opportunity is fairly large for all our companies in the sector, but at the same time, we can, we also cannot take for granted what we do today will be done in the same way. If we don't embrace parts of what's available and embed them in our service offerings, we'll definitely have a disruptive effect from a you know from a client standpoint because clients are looking for if they needed a certain number of of capacity, you know whether it was through a number of you know agile teams or pods they're not going to need that much for the same level of service. But keep in mind, we are in an environment where software is still leading the world. So net-net, there is more demand for software each year than it was in the year prior. And that really is the big tailwind. And you know, if you if you now overlay that with the with the wave that we started with with the cloud migration and, and the adoption of cloud and all things tech stack, I think the opportunity is still pretty large. So net-net, yes, there will be some cannibalization or you know effect of AI on the type of services we deliver. But overall, I think there's a bigger tailwind than, than a headwind. 
and you know we've, we've seen that play out over the last many years i'll give you an example 10 years ago a very large portion of indian it used to be providing testing services that has shrunk by you know an order of magnitude in the last 10 years because of availability of devops and agile development methodology so i think it's a it's another way of thinking about how do we renovate our service offerings so we can continue to stay ahead of the curve as it relates to capturing net new you know addressable market versus just seeing the market shrink for us one last question which is of course a question that many people are concerned about the entire question of reducing headcounts are we going to be seeing layoffs and companies not replacing attrition maybe replacing people with ai how do you see the entire uh, headcount and the job factor playing itself out as we go forward yeah i think the i'm in a pretty straightforward school of camp, you know thought there uh, the, the camp i belong to is that it's not that ai will take away jobs it's just that people who don't use ai will lose their jobs so i think uh, it's a lot to do with upgrading of skills it's a lot to do with providing the right you know platform for people to be able to to use and embed ai in their daily life uh, especially in our industry uh, so i think it's a it's a it's a pretty uh, you know straightforward path we have to make sure that we create net new skills and and reskill people and at the same time uh, our clients will will need the those same services and the and the help on that front as well so i think we are uh, we are very focused on creating that that upskilling and cross skilling environment for our, our our people and of course embedding ai in in many of our process, processes that we follow it you know at at the emphasis itself All right, thank you so much Nitin Rakesh, the CEO of Emphasis speaking to us on the India story. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now the world of sport and Kerala has witnessed the rise of countless talented individuals, but only a chosen few have had the honor of representing our nation in cricket. Cricket not necessarily one of the sports that Kerala has been associated with. But today we've got an incredible tale to share with you a story of sheer determination resilience and eventually triumph the story of a 24 year old prodigy from the Kuruchiya tribe in the state who shattered all barriers to make her way into the prestigious Indian national cricket team I'm talking about Meenu Mani the first woman cricketer from Kerala to proudly wear the Indian jersey Last month in Bangladesh she made a debut for the women in blue claiming an impressive five wickets in 3T20 internationals proving without a doubt that she belongs among the absolute best and it's a great pleasure to now be joined by Minumani herself Many thanks and many congratulations for and uh, thanks for joining us right here you've done a fantastic job so we all give our profound congratulations to you how was the experience of playing for India actually it's a proud moment for me because i was waiting uh, f- waiting till uh, after 10 years i'm practicing for this and uh, after i getting there i feel so proud of myself also uh, i was very excited to be part of indian team You know there are so many first associated with your story you're among the first few cricketers from Kerala only a handful of men have also played for for Kerala in the Indian cricket team and certainly the first first woman you are a, one of the first people from a tribal background to actually make it uh, from Kerala to the uh, Indian cricket team as well describe your journey a little bit for us because i know it's a fascinating journey i w- i started uh, when i am studying in 8th standard um that time i used to play with boys in my home only um in the paddy fields and all after uh, after eighth standard i get to know that there is a women team women cricket uh, uh my physical education teacher uh, eighth standard physical education teacher told me about uh, women cricket and uh, she asked me about do you have a interest in cricket like that and i said yes and then she introduced me to one of our vayana district association coach uh, shana was shana was sir and he introduced me to uh, vayana district team like that i started yeah so i was just about to say in a place like kerala where cricket is not as big as it is in other parts of the state did it take time for you to get recognition now of course you're a superstar there in kerala aren't you we even had a, a railway junction named after you and you must be getting mobbed wherever you go yes of course uh, 
now only all the people knows me because uh, i am the only one women cricketer from kerala to play for india so uh, now everyone uh, recognizing me because of this cricket also that uh, junction uh, i have seen a lot of a uh, lot of uh, celebrities named roads and buildings like that so even i was surprised by seeing that minu mani junction also i am feel so proud even my parents they were like um, they were also so proud of me and because uh, i my own i took a decision to uh, take up cricket so they believed in that they trusted me and they supported me uh, in the beginning they didn't supported me and after that uh, they have uh, they started seeing my every achievements that time uh, they automatically they become more supportive you know the sort of a background where you come from the tribal background you worked in the fields when you were young is this something that you're seeing a lot of in the in the cricket team in other places that people from relatively poorer backgrounds places where they didn't have all the opportunities when they were young are now being able to transform their lives and transform their families lives thanks to cricket yeah uh, in my uh, community uh, they won't allow girls to play with boys and also uh, they were like um, you are a girl you can't do this like that their response and i was like uh, i don't bother about anything from uh, what others say about me like that i just want to play and i um, even my parents also uh, was like don't go don't play like that but i just want to uh, i just started for a entertainment after knowing cricket and after no, after learning about cricket i uh, i took as a passion and i move forward uh, from uh, from 9th to uh, my uh, graduation i was uh, practicing in kerala cricket academy so that time uh, i was not uh, feeling any uh, what any uh, difficulty in my practice or tra training after that um, after that after my graduation i was like uh, i was to i should travel every day uh, one and a half hours to reach my uh, ground and uh, practice there and I, that was uh, more challenging and i was like i can't do i also i i put myself down but uh, whenever i feel i'm going down that uh, that time i should uh, i should think that for what i started this and i have a big dream in front of me like that i bounce back minumani thank you so much for joining us we're going to be tracking your career and your achievements with a great deal of interest right here on the india story because in many ways you you represent what the india story is all about the sort of opportunities that people get and the way that they can take advantage of them to transform their lives and that's all we have for you on the program this week but we'll be back next week with all the big new stories out of india and the biggest guests to help you understand them and analyze them thanks for watching we'll be back next week